It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Sub-Saharan Africa has been experiencing extreme drought with some 20 million people at risk of starvation and many more experiencing food insecurity. At times like this, when people are in crisis and starving, multinational companies such as agribusiness company Monsanto try to move in and offer aid and support and try to influence national policy regarding food production. While some experts say that genetically modified seeds are the answer to the problem of drought and, and uh, poor growing conditions, other experts disagree. While the battle goes on, probably all sides would prefer it that GMO corporate giant Monsanto not be in charge of the country's national seed policies, which it turns out is exactly the case in the southern eastern African country of Malawi. Joining us now to discuss this today is Tim A. Wise from the Small Planet Institute. He's just returned from Malawi and he's senior researcher and director and of the Land and Food Rights Program, who recently authored an article, Did Monsanto Write Malawi Seed Policy? He is the author of the upcoming book, Feeding Illusions, Agrobusiness, Family Farmers, and the Future of Food. Thanks for joining us, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here, Sharmini. So, Tim, uh, first, uh, tell us about food producing conditions in Malawi at the moment. And I understand that you know, the entire sub-Saharan African uh, countries are in crisis at the moment. But for today, let's just focus in on Malawi. Yeah, I just came back from Malawi 10 days ago. Um, and, the, you know, actually, the they had a better year this year than they had the previous two, which was encouraging to see. Um, um, two years ago, there had been devastating floods. Last year, they had a devastating drought, which swept across most of, most of Southern Africa, um, cutting uh, food production dramatically. This year they had um, a new problem, but they had better rains. And so most of the places I went in Southern Malawi were, had seen better harvests, um, despite the influx of, the infestation of, of uh, fall armyworms, which had uh, a new pest to the region uh, again, people are trying to sort out where that came from, whether it's related to climate change and changing um, conditions. Um, but um, harvests were a little bit better this time. It was encouraging to see. Right. And tell us about Monsanto's presence in Malawi and how uh, you found out about their presence uh, in the country. Well, I've been researching in Southern Africa for the last four Four years um, as part of the um, part of the research for my for my book, and um, I Monsanto is um, is one of the major uh, seed providers in in a lot of countries in Africa. Um, probably the largest or second largest seed provider in, um, in commercial seed seller in in Malawi. Um, they're not selling genetically modified um, seeds, not yet anyway. Um, the, most African countries um, ban the sale uh, and cultivation of genetically modified seeds, particularly for uh, food crops, um, which are considered more sensitive than something like cotton. But um, so Monsanto has had a, has had a significant commercial presence in, in Malawi for a long time. And, um, and uh, how are they working in Malawi? Now, how are they trying to influence national policies? Well, the, um, as part of a broad effort that is being supported by the um, developed countries, uh, Global Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, um, uh, an initiative um, supported and, and, um, and promoted by the Obama administration. Um, the, there's a, a specific effort in Africa to get um, uh, private companies, multinational firms to invest 
and to create better business conditions for them to invest. And so part of the deal is that the donors, the international donors provide money for agricultural development. The, um, the companies pledge to invest and the governments are then uh, sign on to a series of uh, policy reforms um, that uh, some have decried as a new set of conditionalities on aid. Um, included in those reforms are reforms to seed policies, and the seed policies that um, are being promoted are very much policies that favor uh, commercial seed producers in general and multinational seed producers in particular. And they do that at the, um, at the cost of the rights of farmers to save, um, exchange, and sell the seeds that they've been uh, developing on their own farms and, um, and that constitute in Malawi an estimated 80% of, of the seeds used in the country. Uh, are by small farmers and family farms uh, who are growing things, preserving their seeds and then using it to grow the next year's crop or next season's crop. Um, but you discovered that recently at a seed fair in Malawi, the government has applied some restrictions on that process where farmers could come and show their uh, seeds and talk about their seeds and their experience with some of these seeds. Give us some specific examples of how that fair became um, uh, the site of your uncovery in terms of how Monsanto is involved in the food policy in the country. Well, in, while I was in Malawi, I was in, I was in rural areas. I was talking with farmers who were engaged in a really creative project, um, kind of rescuing and rehabilitating, restoring the quality of a native or variety of orange maize, a corn variety that is very hot, rich in vitamin A and has a lot of other very favorable properties. So farm groups um, under a program called the Malawi Agroecology um, farmer, to, uh, farmer to Farmer Exchange uh, Agroecology Program um, in southern Malawi have been experimenting with this. Um, using agroecology methods to, uh, to improve nutritional uh, diversity by improving crop diversity on farms and doing so without, um, without inputs. Um, so I'd, I'd come straight off of seeing these uh, very successful um, cultivation of this new orange maize variety that has been grown but in the shadows in Malawi for a long time. And there and the group's trying to promote its use and expand its use, sell, sell seeds to other communities. Um, and, and at the time, just before I went to Malawi, a notice appeared in the paper saying that the government, the agriculture ministry, was going to restrict um, the, uh, the, uh, the seeds that could be shown and displayed at seed fairs. These are events that take place at a, sometimes at a large um, larger level organized by, by a state ministry uh, office, um, but usually at a local or village level. Um, and it's where all kinds of seed providers come and, and show their best seeds from the last season and try to sell some of them to other farmers who were looking to improve their crops. The notice indicated that they were, that only certified seeds should be displayed at these, um, at these uh, events. And that essentially would, would restrict any, any sales or promotion to, uh, to the commercial seed providers. Um, I began to investigate that, um, what was behind that, and in the course of that investigation disco discovered that the seed policy that is actually not in place yet, but has been under discussion for many years, um, had the fingerprints of Monsanto all over it. And um, what are some of the issues associated with a GMO or Monsanto seeds that worry you? Well, the, the, um, the immediate issue in, in Malawi uh, it, it isn't so much GMOs. GMOs are still banned. Um, um, but M Monsanto and other companies sell a lot of so-called hybrid seeds, that is, improved seeds that 
um, are designed to get higher yields, generally operate, generally perform much better with uh, synthetic fertilizer. Um, both the seed and the fertilizer needs to be purchased every year. Malawi has had a, um, a program of subsidizing those purchases for small-scale farmers. Um, so, so Monsanto's real goal is to open up and continue to expand the sale of its hybrid uh, corn seeds, mainly. Um, in Malawi. Um, that, uh, that means that they have an interest in um, seeing uh, pressures put on uh, small-scale farmers who are saving and exchanging seeds, and certainly pressures put on successful projects like this orange maize project, where they have a native variety that doesn't need to be produced, doesn't need to be purchased every year by farmers, so it saves the money doesn't require uh, synthetic fertilizer to, be, to grow at a high yield, produces a, um, a kind of corn that is um, really favorable for the uses that Malawian uh, households make of it, uh, grinding it often by hand into uh, uh, a meal that can be made into a kind of porridge and what's called enzima, um, which is the real staple food of uh, of Malawi. Um, that nutritious food is suddenly um, uh, suddenly stands as a threat to a company like Monsanto and one way to eliminate a threat is in, instead of coming out with a product that is more desirable is to try to outlaw it. So the seed policy um, is threatens to be very restrictive on the sales of such farmer saved seeds. Um, in the market. Right. Um, Tim, you've done work on these issues in other parts of the world as well, for example, Mexico. Um, and it's important because especially maize corn is, is, is subsistence uh, food for most of, in this case, Malawi. Um, how, how does these policies end up affecting the local food production? Um, and uh, what people actually need to survive. Well, the the um, in Malawi, the the effect of um, the government's heavy commitment and promotion to so-called green revolution technologies—that is, uh, the commitment to uh, improved seeds, meaning hybrid seeds that have to be purchased every year, and the fertilizers that are required to make them grow. Um, and yield in, in the way they're supposed to. Um, that commitment goes directly against the, um, the practice of the majority of the vast majority of small-scale farmers uh, in Malawi, who are largely subsistence farmers. Some are trying to grow for the market as well, um, and um, they absolutely need. Uh, good seeds and sometimes they need better seeds but what they really need is better farming practices um, and those farming practices need to be resilient to changing climate um, to floods to drought they need to be uh, adapted to local conditions and um, a key resource in that adaptation is uh, the, f the farmers own saved seeds which they have cultivated in their local areas and adapted to their local conditions. Can those seeds be improved to have higher yields, to be more resilient? Absolutely. Is replacing them with purchased commercial seeds developed by companies like Monsanto the solution for food security and climate change in, in a place like Malawi? It certainly isn't. Um, it might be appropriate for some larger scale commercial operations. It's, um, it, it's really inappropriate for the small scale farmers of Malawi. And as soon as um, the subsidies go away and people fully expect that the subsidy program is um, just fiscally not sustainable for the government of Malawi, as soon as those seeds and those fertilizers stop being subsidized, um, those farmers are going to have to have to reach into very shallow pockets to find the money to buy those inputs every year, and they just won't have the resources to do it. 
Tim, tell us about how Monsanto ended up having such a big role in the national seed policy uh, in Malawi. Well, I hadn't realized um, the extent of their influence until I was speaking with uh, someone who has coordinated the uh, Civil Society Agriculture Network, the network of, of different organizations, farmer organizations and others who work on agriculture policy. He'd been working for 10 years with that with that organization until very recently and I was having dinner with him and arguing with him about some of the some of the restrictions in the seed policy on farmer saved seeds and I said to him you know it it doesn't have there's no reason this policy needs to be needed to be so so severe it's easy to write a a seed policy that recognizes farmers rights to save seeds and exchange and sell them and also it puts in place better regulations for the so-called formal seed sector. Why? It's almost, I said it's almost as if, as if Monsanto wrote the policy. And there was this long pause, and he looked at me and he said, well, you know, um, a Monsanto official was one of the two people who wrote the policy. Um, and uh, I looked into it further, and, and indeed, it was... Uh, a researcher at the Agriculture University was was commissioned to draft the policy, and he brought in uh, so the the Malawi, the person who had just left the position of um, of country manager for Monsanto in Malawi. Right, and uh, Tim, while you were there, did you find a pushback and organizing efforts uh, on the part of the farmers? Uh, people working in this area in terms of the, what the government is uh, planning to propose and, and what Monsanto's influence in the country has been? Oh, absolutely. There's, a, there's very strong resistance um, on the part of farmer organizations to, um, to this policy. And, and frankly, they were outraged um, when they learned, as I learned in the course of my time there, that a a recently departed Monsanto executive from Malawi had been one of the co-authors of the seed policy that's now under consideration. There's a uh, civil society groups, farmer groups have called a meeting for that I understand is to take place tomorrow to um, try to uh, push back against uh, the the current uh, imposition of the seed policy, which I was told by one of the government officials in charge of it is, as far as he's concerned, finished and not open for further revision. Farm groups and uh, civil society organizations have something else in mind. Hmm. All right, Tim, I thank you so much for joining us today and all the best with the very important work you're doing in this area. Thank you, Sharmini. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.